In March last year, I traveled to Halat, which is a small village north of Beirut in Lebanon. I went there to meet a woman whose name is Nuhad al-Shami. She's 78 years old. She has 12 kids, 60 grandchildren. She's worked all her life in the field. She's baked bread for the whole family every day. And she's prayed every day since she can remember. And in that respect, she's no different to anybody in the area. They all work very hard, have plenty of kids, and they pray a lot, especially to Virgin Mary. She is special, though, to many people in Lebanon and outside. She says she was miraculously cured by St. Charbel, a Maronite priest from the 19th century. And I went to meet Nuhat to talk to her and listen to her story. And here's what she told me. At the beginning of 1993, she had a stroke. She was diagnosed with dryness in uh, her arteries, which meant basically that she was almost completely paralyzed. Uh, the doctor said, it's incurable. He basically told her to go home and wait for nothing to happen. So she did go home. And at night, on the 22nd of January, 1993, St. Charbel came to her house. Together with a fourth century Syriac monk, St. Maron, the founder of the Maronite Church. And there was Virgin Mary with them as well. So uh, St. Charbel approached Nuhad, he touched her neck, and he told her, I'm going to perform a surgery on you. As you may imagine, she was rather surprised. And there was this light coming out of St. Charbel, illuminating the whole room. And at first she tried to reason with the saint. She said, look, all the doctors told me it's incurable. There's no use doing it. She even asked Virgin Mary for help. She said, Blessed Virgin, please do something. Tell him not to perform this operation because I'm going to suffer. I don't want to stand all this pain. But St. Charbel did perform the surgery. And when he finished, St. Maron approached Nuhat. He gave her a glass of water and he said, you're going to drink this water, then you're going to stand up and walk. So she did drink the water, she stood up, and she walked. She went to the bathroom, she looked in the mirror, and she couldn't believe her eyes. She thought she was dreaming all along, but she wasn't. The paralysis was gone, she was cured. And next day in the morning she went to a doctor, and obviously the doctor didn't know what to do with her. The doctor didn't know what happened. And uh, since then, she's been examined by dozens of doctors who don't have a clue what had happened to her on that night. And thousands of people have come to her house, and they all believe that it was a miracle. Actually, the Roman Catholic Church declared Nuhat's case as the miracle. So here I was, sitting in front of this woman, telling me all this. There were two wounds on either side of her neck, about 10 centimeters long. Uh, they actually didn't look like old wounds. They looked like fresh scars, except they have looked like that for the last 22 years. And apparently they open up on every 22nd day of every month and blood runs out of them, which has healing properties. That's what people say. I don't know if it does or it doesn't because I wasn't there on the 20, 22nd day of the month. And uh, I know what you probably want to ask me because everybody asks me the same question when I tell them the story. And the question is, did you believe her? Do you believe that this Lebanese woman was cured by a 19th century Maronite monk 
whose body, by the way, refused to decompose, helped by a Syriac monk from the fourth century and Virgin Mary? I'll come back to that question. I went to Egypt, to Cairo. There's a place called Mukatam Hill in the middle of this 20 million people monster city. It's also a borough in which 50,000 Coptic Christians live. They all do rubbish. There are rubbish collectors, rubbish sellers, rubbish recyclers, quite innovative for that matter, according to many Western people who come to visit them quite often. And they seem to consider them some kind of avant-garde of the ecology movement, which is nonsense, of course, because all they do is just want to sell rubbish they collect from the streets of Cairo at the highest price, and they do it quite well. The garbage city, as it's called, is a combination of rubbish dump, uh, an, an open-air shopping gallery, and, and obviously a, a living quarters. Uh, the streets are lined up with houses, and on the first floor you usually have a rubbish uh, dump or a rubbish warehouse or a rubbish factory. Uh, and on top floors, on higher floors, that's where people live. There's also a monastery in the area. It's called St. Simon the Tanner Monastery. It's actually a collection of churches thrust into the Mukatam Hill. The churches are in the caves. And the whole of the Mukatam rock is lined up with carvings of biblical scenes. They are made by an artist. I, I, I went there to see that guy. He's Polish, actually. His name is Mariusz Dybich, known as Mario to people living there. Mario used to study to be a Salesian monk at some point, but he was rather radical, probably too radical, socially radical for his superiors. So he left the order by mutual consent. He went to Cairo, where he met Father Saman, who, uh, who is a Christian priest. And he was working in the garbage city at that time. And they started working together. First, Mario worked as a handyman. He helped Father Saman clear the caves of the rubble, did all, all sorts of old jobs. And at some point, Father Saman suggested that he start carving the biblical scenes in the Mukatam rock. And uh, I wanted to know what the idea behind it was, and Mario explained to me that actually a large majority of the Coptic Christians living there were, were illiterate. So the idea was to change what Father Saman was saying from the altar into the living Bible. And so he Although he never had worked in the rock before, he started doing it, and he's been doing it ever since, for the last 20 years or so. Mario is an immensely popular figure in that area, especially among the kids, and no wonder. He organizes trips for the kids, he helped them build uh, an artificial football pitch, and First of all, he's coached hundreds of kids in rock climbing. He's built them a 200-meter rope course, certainly the, the, the longest in Egypt and probably the longest in Africa. So it's lots of fun. And he's also... Uh, he's trusted by these people, by this very closely knit community, which over the years have learned not to trust strangers, not to accept newcomers. And I asked Mario how that happened. And he told me they didn't want to accept me at the beginning. They thought I was nuts. Who would come to Cairo and live in the rubbish dump with the garbage people? They thought I was perhaps running away from justice. I was some kind of fugitive. Maybe I had killed somebody in Poland. But over the years, they tried to understand me, and they loved me, and I loved them back, or perhaps it was the other way around, because they understood I was there to serve them. That was the key word, 
that he said. I was there of, of service to them. Uh, I asked Mario if he missed anything about Europe, and he said, what is there to be missed? And uh, I said, okay, so what is it there that you get that you wouldn't get back, back in Poland, for instance, or in any other European country? He's an energetic, enterprising guy. He would make his life anywhere. And he said, he told me this story about a 10-year-old kid who approached him once, and he said, thank you, Mario. Thank you for building us this church. And this, Mario said, this, is, this was worth living for. I went to southern Turkey, uh, to a place called Kahta, and I met a woman named Guzin. Actually, she has a different name now. I'll tell you why. She lives in this small town in southern Turkey in a Muslim family. That is, she used to believe they were Muslim, but when she was small, she saw her grandma come back home from the mosque, kneel down, and make a sign of the cross, crossing herself. Guzin was perplexed. She didn't know what to make of it. She said, Granny, what are you doing? We're Muslims. Why are you doing it? But Granny ignored the question. She didn't want to talk about it. And neither did Guzin's father. But nagged by the kids, Guzin had two brothers, the father finally took them and told them the family story. And they indeed used to be Christians. That was before 1915 before the genocide, when uh, almost a million Christians, Armenians, Assyrians, Greek, in Turkey, were killed, chased out of their houses, or forced to convert to Islam to save their lives. And the family I was visiting converted. So when Guzin found out the family's story, she told her father, I want to get baptized when I grow up. I want to get back to my roots, my Christian roots. And when she was 18, that was in 2006, she got baptized. She found a church in Adyaman, which is a bigger place near Kahta. She found a priest there, she started going there, and she got baptized. And she also changed her name. She's Christine now, Christine meaning belonging to Christ. She started dating an Armenian guy, and Christine's mother told me it wasn't by accident. She positively wanted to meet a Christian. She wanted to marry into a Christian family. She wanted to start her life as a Christian. Her mother, Guzine, Christine's mother, was terrified. And to understand why, you have to know that Adyaman is a hotbed of political Islam in southern Turkey. Dozens of young Turkish men and women from that area have gone over the last years to join to Syria, to join the Islamic State and to fight within the ranks of the Islamic State. So that's why her mother was terrified. She thought they were going to be killed. Living your life as a Christian openly is out of the question in that area. Living your life discreetly as a Christian in that area is life-threatening. But they do have their life back as Christians. They, uh, they have a son now. His name is Tolga. He goes to school. He also studies Aramaic, Aramaic language. That's the language that Jesus Christ spoke when he was alive, or, or a new version of it. And at some point, Christine told me, I want Tolga to speak Aramaic because it's our native tongue. I didn't know what to make of it because I thought they were Turkish after all, so uh, perhaps Turkish is their native tongue. But no, she said, we are Aramaic Christians. Aramaic is our native tongue. We want our life back as Aramaic Christians. I was listening to this story 
And obviously, I couldn't help parallels, thinking about parallels with what I had heard in Poland. And perhaps Pauline is the best place to talk about it. The genocide that had been politicized and falsified for dozens of years, both back there in southern Turkey and in post-war Poland. A new generation of kids, children, grandchildren of survivors who want to rediscover, reclaim their roots, reclaim their ethnic and religious origins. Of course, the um, political and, and, and social contexts were different in Turkey and in Poland, but the emotions and the motivations were quite similar. Now, why am I telling you all these stories? I'll tell you why. I am annoyed with all the political questions I get when I talk about my book, Jarno i Krev, The Seed and the Blood. It's a book about Middle Eastern Christians and their struggle for survival in the land that they have lived in for the last 20 centuries or more, obviously, uh, and which over the last 100 years has been extremely hostile to them. It, it's a story full of politics, full of history, sociology, and et cetera, psychology, et cetera. But politics doesn't explain what has been happening to these people over the last years. Actually, politics muddles things. Pol politics reduces people to pawns in somebody's games, political games. I'll tell you what, I'm a reporter. I meet people, I talk to them, I listen to what they tell me, I look at them, how they behave, I look at what's around them, and then I try to connect it and to make it into a story. Um, I, either I write a story or make a radio piece about it. And as a reporter, you have a clear choice. There is this temptation to go into politics, for instance, to get biased, to, uh, to write a political treatise, to uh, get your ideas from somebody else. Or you open up to the person who is talking, who is standing in front of you, who is opening up for you. And I have made my choice. And I'll tell you what, it doesn't really matter who cured Nuhad al-Shami. I'm a fairly skeptical person, but enough about me. What is important is that this miracle has been at the center of this woman's life for the last quarter century, and probably is going to remain like that for the rest of her life. Mario's story is so breathtaking because his life choices are probably at the opposite end of what most of us would consider a successful and meaningful life. And Christine's story is simply fascinating, overwhelming. Never ever in my life have I met a faith as strong as hers. So only when you open up to the person without the things that you have uploaded in your head before, can you get to the real essence of the human experience? And I consider myself to be immensely privileged to be able to talk to these three people I told you about and to many others that I met and talked to while researching my book. And I hope that the reader gets at least a little bit of that insight, as I did. Mind you, there are other perks as well. At some point, while in Kahta, Christine uh, asked me to write my full name on a piece of paper. I didn't know why, but she did. She asked me, so I did it. I, I never worried about it. And then she left. I thought she was gone for good without saying goodbye. But she wasn't, actually. Uh, she went to a shop and she bought me a shirt. That's the shirt I'm wearing now. This is the shirt she gave me as a, as a gift. 
It was beautifully gift wrapped with a small note on it, which said, nice to meet you, Dariusz Rosiak. Thank you, Christine. It's good to meet people. It's good to talk to them without prejudice. Thank you.